And I know I'm meant to do this every time I speak. I'm meant to let you know I am also a missionary in a sense. And what that means is, for those of you that are friends of mine, Brian, what do you do? My ministries really come down to three things, missions, marriages, and ministry. I don't get a salary anywhere. I'm not paid staff. If I don't tell people this, they're like, well, how do you survive? I raise full-time support. Um, hours of prep, traveling, doing all this kind of stuff. I preached a conference yesterday. I'm going to Seattle. You know, in the next week, four services for kids, two for marriage, all day Sunday. I have felt called to this. Some of our elders, some of our pastors, three years ago said, Brian, you are crazy to go start a business or do whatever else. You are naturally an evangelist. And if you get one of these cards out there, you'll read 1 Corinthians 9, 14. And it says, God commands... We think about God commanding, we say we better listen. It says, God commands those who do the work of the gospel should live by it. And after sitting with many leaders, after seeing many evangelists struggle to understand their place in the church, and I believe the church in general I'm talking about is grasping it, I believe that it's just a season when we say, hey, what do we need to support? How are these people meant to live? Because I'm operating at about 60% of what I could be doing. Guys like me, guys like Nolan are running around thinking about funding when God wants us focused on the things of God. Amen? Amen. If you guys need a Bible, raise up your hands. Go in your Bibles to 1 John 5 and we are jumping right into this. And guys, please be praying for the team, for leadership, for the church, for little Addy Shaddix. It shook us up so much this week. We are in their life group, but God is faithful. And so I'm going to cut through a lot of stuff today. We're jumping right into 1 John 5. We've been in this for a couple of months now, and there's a lot to cover. And if you've been here, you might have almost lost track of where we're going. He spoke about discipline. He spoke about love. He spoke about the spirit of Antichrist. But as we begin to summarize in the next few weeks as we close this off, what is John really saying to us? He's telling us about heresy, and he's proclaiming the falsities that are in the church. And if you think about John for a moment... Who is he? This isn't just some book. I know it's inspired by God. But this is John who was called as a fisherman, a son of Zebedee, as a youth. This is John who laid his head up on Jesus' chest, who was there in the garden with the three, who was on the Mount of Transfiguration watching Jesus glowing, heard God's voice, saw Moses and Elijah. This is John who referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And if all this isn't enough, he wrote the Gospel of John. First, second, third John, and he wrote the book of Revelation. John is now an elder. He's the last living an apostle. And he's a pastor in the churches in Ephesus, writing to the churches in Asia Minor. And he's writing to them as my children. What that means is simply this. He was a Christian before you. And as you came to faith, he is watching you grow up and he is writing to say this. Guys, there is heresy entering the church. How many of you guys know there's always heresy trying to enter the church? Amen? Amen. Where do the wolves hang out? Around the sheep. What do you do? Feed the sheep, starve the goats, and you shoot the wolves. Amen? John is shooting the wolves in this passage. He is summarizing for us because what they are teaching is that they're enlightened. What they're teaching is you a Christian, but God couldn't have really come in the flesh because the flesh by the Gnostic teaching is really evil and wicked. How could God, who is gracious and merciful and loving and perfect, possibly walk the earth as a man? And why this is dangerous is because they said, once you're enlightened, your flesh doesn't matter. You could have gone to the strip club last night. You could have snorted lines of whatsoever last night. You could have beaten someone up. You could have hated someone. You could be someone who lives nothing like a Christian, but because you're supposedly enlightened, you're good to go. And John is writing them to say, hey, as a grandfather in the faith, You cannot trust these sayings. You need to abide in Christ. And as we get there in 1 John 5, prior to that, here's what he says. 1 John 1, 3, I want to remind you. He says, Brian or branches, we can say that it's to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. This is important. I walked with Jesus. I spoke to Jesus. I embraced Jesus. He referred to me. God bless you. As the disciple who he loved. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, and we want you to have fellowship with us and walk with Jesus and walk with the Father. He's writing to us to say, beware. Here we are, 1 John 5. And I'm going to try and read this in a tone so you understand what he's saying. He says, everyone who believes that Jesus the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves those who've been born of Him. 
By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and we obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Verse 4, he says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Remember now, the heretics are saying he can't possibly be the Son of God. And he's saying, guys, this is where your salvation is. In verse 6, he continues on. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. There are three that testify. The Spirit, the water, the blood, and these three agree says in verse 9, If we receive the testimony of men, meaning these heretics, the testimony of God is greater. This is the testimony of God that He is born concerning His Son. For whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in Himself, meaning the Holy Spirit is in you. Whoever does not believe, God has made him a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has born concerning His Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, This life is found in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. And you can read that and say, He is just redundant. He is going back and forth. So I'm saying this from the start. When you can preach topical, you can go a lot of places, talk about a lot of stuff. But we have to get what He's saying here. We have to say, John, what do you want us to know? What he wants us to know is He is putting the nail in the coffin to the argument of who Jesus is. If I say to you, who is Jesus? You say, he's the son of God. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior. Why would you say that? Because you take it for granted. You were probably raised in Calvary Chapel coming out of the Jesus movement. Amen? How many of you guys? Maybe you were raised around America in the Bible Belt. But you were talking to people who have been taught that God is one. God is only one. There's no Trinity. There's no Messiah figure in that sense that he walked the earth then. There's no Holy Spirit in the sense that they understand. And said what they're saying is, no, 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 God is one. And biblically, God is one. But the Bible says God created in Genesis. It says in Colossians, Jesus created. And in the book of Job, it says the Spirit of God made me. And in fact, today, if you can speak Arabic and you were to go to the Dome of the Rock, written on the Dome of the Rock right now today, people are probably reading it. It says God is not begotten, nor does God begat. God has no son. He did not create anyone else that was God. And when you think about this heresy, that's how serious it is that John is writing against it. Many faiths say he did not begot anyone. Muslim faith says that. Many of the Christian supposed faiths, but cults have variations of who Jesus is. And we'll go into that in a moment. But it's amazing to me that Muslims say he didn't begot anyone. Because if you think about who Muslims originally grew up looking up to, it was Abraham. What did God tell Abraham? Abraham, I want you to take who up on the mountain? Isaac. Abraham was a pagan and they were known for sacrificing their firstborn children. It was the greatest offering they could give to their gods. And so what does God do when he enters the scene? He tells Abraham, Abraham, you've received this child of blessing later on in life, a hundred years. And this could have been his idol. This could have been all that made Abraham who he was. Surely, because he wouldn't have had a lineage without Isaac. And God says, Abraham, take your Isaac up on the mountain. And you remember the story. Why would God tell him to do that? Because God was about to reveal to us that he didn't need you to sacrifice your children. Amen? Because John 3.16, what does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only what? Begotten son. John is writing to say, don't believe the heresy. Don't carve things on the wall. Though 800 years Muhammad would come. Don't believe what they're going to tell you. Don't believe what they're knocking on the door to tell you and sell you in this day and age with various cults. He says in 1 John 5, 1, and listen guys, I know you know this already. This might sound redundant, but you've got to see what he's saying. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. What's happened in this culture is the Gnostics believed that Jesus was simply a man. They said this guy, Jesus the man, lived a perfect life, and I don't know how, In God's green earth, he did that. Amen? The Bible says all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. He couldn't have just been a man. Only God is perfect. But they're saying when Jesus showed up to the Jordan, he was baptized by his cousin as the Spirit of God descended upon him in the form of a dove. Jesus gained this God consciousness. 
It's true his ministry began in the Jordan River when he was 30 years of age. So now Jesus, the man, the carpenter, like Pastor Brock or whoever you are in here and you've been a really perfect man your whole life, suddenly the Spirit descends on you and you have God consciousness. And you're now the Messiah for three and a half years. Why is it crazy? Because they actually teach that right when he got to the cross, before they put the nails in, the Spirit of God left him. He was hanging on a cross just as a man. And you know why they say this? Because when he cries out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why has they forsaken me? They see what he's actually saying is, why are you taking the divine nature from me? Why are you taking the divine nature from me? How radical is this? It's crazy. It's another gospel, but even here in the early church, less than 70 years later, you were seeing the heresy of the fallen demonic beginning to sow its seeds into this culture. That's not what happened. When Jesus was hanging up on the cross, he says, my God, my God, why has he forsaken me? You know the answer, right? God, why did you forsake Jesus? For Brian. For Brian's lies. For Brian's lust. For Brian's issues. God, why did you forsake Jesus? For branches. Why did you forsake Jesus? For God so loved the what? The world that he gave his only begotten son. Amen. I hope Muslims are listening online. You guys need to see what Jesus Christ did for you. But do you know in this day and age today, people are still teaching that the Jesus who hung on the cross is not God? If you open the Watchtower Bible, what does it say? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was a God. Some God hung up on there. They believe that Jesus is Michael the archangel. So did a man hang on there? Did a God hang on the cross? Did Michael the archangel hang on the cross? Did the brother of Satan hang on the cross or not? I need to know who's hanging on the cross for my salvation because John, the apostle from Ephesus, is writing to you and me saying, little children, you better get this. Don't believe the testimony of a man. You need to know the Jesus we are preaching about because everything in your life, church, stands and falls on who Jesus is. If Jesus is not God, what are you doing in church on Sunday? Amen? I don't know why I preached the conference yesterday and prepped all week. I am wasting my time. Those waves sure look good. Amen? That's the reality. That's the reality. The Bible says if Jesus really isn't God, we above all people are to be pitied most among men. If you li- that's a real verse. If you lived your life for Jesus to get to the end of your life and he wasn't who he said he was, how sad it is for you. But that's not what he's teaching. This is not what he's saying, but I'm saying to you, if he is God, you should live every moment like he's God. You should trust in him like he's God with your life, with your prayers, all that your hand puts to He says in verse 1 again, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And this word born is important. The heretics couldn't have been born. This is the same word born that is used when Jesus speaks to Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night. He wanted truth, but he didn't want no one to see him. Why? Because he was a Pharisee. And he came asking about the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus tells him plainly, John 3, 5, Nicodemus. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of what? Water, which is repentance, baptism, and of the Spirit, which is regeneration and being born again. No one can enter the kingdom unless they are born again. And this is important, verse 6. Flesh gives birth to flesh. What does that mean? But the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. Nicodemus, you should not be surprised at the saying that you must be born again. Guys, how did we get into this mess? Whose fault was it? I know it's the serpent's fault, but it was Adam's fault. Amen? Adam continued to give birth through his wife over and over and over. And do you know when you study the Hebrew genetically, you and I carry the same seed within us? That's why everyone dies. How is God going to bypass that? Well, he has to have someone born that doesn't have a father whose name is Adam. Amen? Was there anyone that's ever been born that was born of a virgin and his father wasn't Adam? Jesus He's saying, when you believe in this lineage, when you put your faith in him, Brian, you can only give birth to the flesh, and for the rest of eternity, you can never bring about the Messiah. The Messiah is Jesus, and the only way you come to him is by being forgiven and being born again, Romans 5, 12 says. Just as sin entered the world through one man, that is Adam, and death through sin, and in this way it came to all people because all sin. We all die because of our sin. In verse 18 it says, consequently... Just as one trespass, just because of Adam's sin, resulted in condemnation for all people, 
so also just one righteous act resulted in the justification for all people. And the church said, Amen. Because He went to the cross for you 2,000 years ago, it is all erased. You have to be born again. Do you remember when you were born again? I do. I remember sitting in my office, divorcing my wife, mad, wanting to kill myself. That's my life. If you don't know me, that's how radical it is. A lot of fights, eight fights in one month on community service, hating life. Opening up the Bible, the Genesis 126 made in his image. God showed up and saved me, redeemed me after seven months. It was this Jesus that changed my life. And I now sound like a crazy Christian like all of you. Amen. <laughs> Amen. We're crazy to the world. But the reality is since that time and going and sharing, listen, I was at a skate park a week ago at a festival. Forty kids came forward. Seven kids went outside and got baptized. Thank you, God. But sometimes you get so used to seeing that. But when I think about someone being a born again, you know what shakes me now? Is when it's the people out of the blue. It's the people you know. It's the one that comes to you and says, Brian, Jesus has saved me. Brian, I see the Savior of the world. As Barris is making fun, obviously, of course, you know, we're doing jujitsu. I like jujitsu. I'm, I'm not a weight guy. I'm not a gym guy, but I don't mind rolling around with a bunch of sweaty guys on the mats, as crazy as that sounds. Amen? <laughs> My professor, a black belt, used to come to this, this church. He said, Brian, you should come roll. He has scripture on the wall. He wants us to get involved. And so as I drive 20 minutes there a couple times a week, I say, Lord, I'm going to use this time for you. I'm going to use it. And listen, it's helped my life. When you wake up with three kids running around, you're doing all this stuff to be able to pray in the car or intentionally do things. And while I'm there, you say, do you want to roll, pastor? You're rolling with atheists who call you pastor. How funny is that? They're wearing geese with scripture on, and scripture on the wall. And my professor, the black belt, is praying after every service. But about a month ago, I was rolling with a guy called Steve, who's 59, no hair, older gentleman, beautiful soul. His kids are in the classes. And he is tough. I mean, he's smaller than me, but they call him War Machine. You know, he's trying to choke you, and he's telling you what he's going to do, and you're sitting there laughing with this guy, and it's all playful. I mean, I know Brian Albright's been going. Other members in the church go. It's a fun thing, and it's something that God is going to use to reach them. Amen? But as I was rolling with this guy, and he's telling me of his sickness, we find out he has stage 4 cancer. And so we're praying for him. Every single time we rolled after that, my professor has everyone pray. Pastor Brian, can you pray? Danny was praying. All these people were praying over all these people. Atheists are praying. You fast forward three or four weeks. I'm traveling a bunch. I come home. It's my wife's birthday, so I go to pick her up something. And as I come down, I go and visit him in the hospital. As I get to the hospital, going into the door, I was not prepared. I rolled with this guy a month ago. He is strong for a guy who's older, that should just be cruising around, hanging out. He's serious. And I walked into that room, and I visit a lot of people. I see a lot of people in, ho in hospitals. I'm aware of what you encounter. But as I walked in this room to see a guy that a few weeks ago was trying to choke me, a man in love, he was sitting on that bed, just, just, I mean, it's weak. His body couldn't speak, looking at me. As I entered that room looking at him, he couldn't even speak to me. He was so weak. And as I sat with him, I'm saying, Lord, I've hung out with this guy for two years. He has heard the gospel. He's in the same place my mother, my mother was before she passed away, and maybe where I will be if this is how God takes me. And his brother says, I haven't been to church in 40 years. We were raised Catholic. I don't talk about God much. I don't know what to do. And Steve's a very loving guy. He's to himself, but he's loving and respectful. And I said, do you mind if I share the gospel with you? And he's like, yeah. He was willing to do whatever. It's amazing. The nurses said they never had this many people visit this man as the amount of guys that came from the jiu-jitsu school, atheists and everything, because they just love this guy. And as I sat and shared the gospel with him, clearly, passages like this, do you know who Jesus is? Do you know what was God on the cross? Do you know what he did for you? As I sat and prayed with him, going home to prepare for a message the next day, I think we might even have slides here if we do. Could you guys put them up for a moment? As I was sitting there in my house prepping a message, look at this message. You see the first text right here? This is what he texts you when I'm sitting at my table. Listen, in all eternity, he says, you spoke the truth. This isn't about me. Forget me. Paul said, imitate me. But look at what he sent me almost two hours later. What did he say? What does he say? I get, you know what? And I told my wife, and my wife started crying instantly. My wife does not cry my wife does not cry, and this shook me. Why? Because he is born again. 
And while the heretics are trying to tear down what Jesus said, and here's what's crazy. I pray for this guy for the next week or so. My kids are praying every day. I'm like, praise God. And I go to class one Monday. I'm rolling with my professor. At the end of the class, I think he's going to say, hey, do you want to pray? And he says, guys, I have to tell you that Steve passed away at 8 o'clock this morning. But I'll tell you what. That's what the glory of God is about. Amen. My son Jude messaged me. Dad, I'm so sorry to hear that. Every time I got to the gym, he would say, hey, Jude, and give me five. He was such a good man, but you know what? He's with Jesus now. Guys, do you get that? Do you get that everything about your life is either Jesus really did what he did, and he's the son of God, and I thought about sharing this. Is it more about me? Do you get it? No. This is what someone did called Jesus, dying and resurrecting for this man. Looking over to my wife, I said, babe, you have to read this. And she begins to weep. And she doesn't know him, that guy, but she says, and then Danny Bradley said, look, Every time you rolled and were choked and attacked, it was all worth it for one to come to faith. Amen? God is at work in every area of your life, wherever you are. There's Steve's everywhere. There's Brian's everywhere. There's you's everywhere. The Gnostics are attacking this. That's why we've got to defend it. And he says this in verse 1, continuing. Everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. In the practical, what he's saying is here comes the heretics attacking goods. So how can they be of God? They're sowing lies, they're sowing discord. But what he's saying to you and me as the church is, guys, if you're Christians, if you're really believers, we're called to love one another. He tells us we should love the Father and we should love everyone else. And if you remember our study a few months back in the Ten Commandments, what was the idea? Why did God give so many commandments in the Old Testament, but why did he give only two through Jesus? What were Jesus' commands? Love the Lord your God with everything and love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. That's the Ten Commandments summarized. Loving the Lord your God is the first four commandments, the vertical to God. Loving your neighbor is horizontal with the exception of the Sabbath. It's, it's nullified. We're in Christ. But when he's writing to the church, he says, guys, these heretics are preaching another Jesus. We're called to love the Father and we're called to love our neighbor. That's why it blows my mind when I meet people who say, I'm a believer, but I can't stand the church. The church is filled with hypocrites. Aren't we hypocrites? I mean, we know the truth. We're trying our best. Amen. Everyone's a hypocrite. We're not trying to be hypocrites. But you think about people who are embittered and angry and mad, and you say, where is the love? And I get it. We faced hard times. I sat with a pastor yesterday that was talking about the next generation, and he said, studies have shown the generation now is called the shaming generation. What they do is they find the newest thing that everyone is doing, and to be relevant, they become part of whatever they're doing, and that becomes their identity. Now everyone looks like this or thinks like this and does this, and I feel like I abound now on some cord. The amount of likes we're getting or the crew we're part of or the clicks we're creating. And he says, how is this generation going to love anyone? How are they going to go to the sick? How are they going to love the outcast? How are they going to love the people that are not think like them? Well, what John is saying is you need to love the Lord your God. You need to be able to love other people like yourself. How so? Because if I'm really a believer and I'm really going to the Lord, I'm really spending time with Jesus, I mean, what is God? God is what? Love. And it's going to run up, rub off on me. It's going to humble me. And I know we don't spend enough time with God as we'd like to. I know He's everywhere. I get it. But He's saying, first of all, that we need to know who the Messiah is. And second of all, we need to be able to love others. And this is what John is doing. He gives us three points throughout this whole gospel, this whole book. The first one is that we must be born again. The second one is that we need to love our fellow believers. And his third point throughout, if you've been following, is that we need to be obedient to God. Verse 2, he says, By this we know that we love the children of God, because when we love God, we obey His commandments. In verse 3, he says, This is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. How many guys are sick of burdens? Two of you. I'm sick of burdens. (laughs) Hearing this week about people in the church, the fires are close to their home, really? Hearing about Chris and his family, really, God? Hearing about all these things that are going on, God's commands are not like that. Prior to this, there's 613 religious traditions in the Jewish faith, and God is saying, that's not what it's like. Do you know what it's like? How many young mothers do we have in here? You guys remember when your wife was pregnant? Women, do you remember having children? And your feet grew? And your hair fell out. And you ate crazy, hey, my wife's had three, and you ate crazy food, right? Everything your husband said, you wanted to kill him. Hey, this is the Bible, right? Let's be truthful today. 
Then what happens? The baby comes out and here's the blessing and everything you put in one end just goes out the other everywhere. You don't get any sleep. Let me ask you this. Would you change it for the world? No. There's no mother that would change it for the world and it is difficult and it is challenging and you could say to some it is a burden, but it's not. That's the commandments of God. I don't want to fly around the world. I don't want to spend 10 days preaching. I feel so drained, but with God I feel like, yes, that's what I'm meant to do. The commandments of God are not burdensome. Serving the church is not burdensome. When you follow Him and trust in Him, stepping into the flow that He's given you, Ephesians 2.10, that's what it's like. If I say, mothers, raise your children, love your children, you say, yeah, I'm right there. And that's what we're like when we hear the preaching of the Word. We want to go to the hospital. We want to love on people. And John's saying, none of them are doing this. Where are we in verse 4? Everyone that has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. What does it mean to overcome the world? He says this three times. We always think of the physical. It means not looking at this, not looking at that. And what he's talking about is there is a spiritual world at work. Satan, fallen angel, is at work in our lives. And I've been at churches where they overemphasize this so much that you don't really know what to do with your faith. Everything that happens in the church, it's demons and it's Satan. I remember being in a deacon meeting one time, and one of the deacons told the other deacon, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> and I was like, and everyone's face just said, okay, I guess Satan's in the room hanging out with us in this guy right now. But the reality is what we do is we say everything is Satan, everything is demonic. And I know that Satan is the father and lies. But there's three things that work in us at all times. You have to know this to understand how you overcome the world. There's the physical struggle, there's the emotional struggle, and there's the spiritual. Things that have happened to you physically have had an effect. Things that have happened emotionally you are still carrying today if you don't bring them to the Lord. But there are the spiritual things. I remember the old church, if kids would get sick, they'd say, bring them anyway. We're just going to pray in tongues over them and God's going to heal them. And I, and I get and I applaud the faith, but a lot of those kids didn't get healed. The idea was that what we're doing is everything is so spiritual, but think about it. When I get angry, is it Satan? When someone's looking at someone online, they shouldn't be, is that always Satan? I mean, in the garden, did Satan hand feed them the fruit or not? No. We can't say everything's demonic, everything's Satan. They made the choice to eat of the fruit. And what he's saying, if you're a mature Christian, you're going to consider the culture. You're going to consider the world. You're going to see, is this better for my marriage? Is this better for what I'm doing with my finances? Is this better for the kingdom of God? Because you know I focus on these things sometimes, and you might say too much, but if you look at the world today, it is crazy. Watching a music video the other day, and it's called God is a Woman. The whole video is about how God is not a man, it's a woman. The next video that came on, and I watched it intentionally to say, what is being fed our children? I won't say your name, walking down the aisle in a church in all black with a halo, saying, I need a savior over and over and over. And every time she shows it, a guy shows up with headphones on that read monster on it. And finally, an angel of death shows up, baptizes her in a church, and her whole focus is to degrade the kingdom of God. We're living in a way where you can succumb to this kingdom, even though you're born again. If we're not mature, if we're not diligent, if we don't look around and say, what is being sown into me? That's why the Bible says, make no room for the flesh. Take every thought captive and think on things that which are above. And see, what's happening is what they're saying is we're enlightened. But I'll tell you today, it isn't the scientist. It isn't the philosopher. It isn't the spiritualist. None of these are the ones that are right with God. How are we right with God? What is it that makes us right with God? Even the church sometimes we say, we've got to have all the right methods and the right plan. What makes it all right is simply who? Jesus. It's simple. I know I'm going on, but this is John's point. Do you get who Jesus is? Do you see? He says in verse 5, Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes in Jesus, who is the Son of God. And then he changes gears. In verse 6, this kind of puzzles people at times because you're saying, why is he going on so much? He says, this is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. But then he says something crazy. He says, not by water only, but by water and the blood. Why would he say Jesus came by water and the blood, but not by water only, but by water and the blood? Well, who is John writing to? Heretics that said, oh yeah, when he was baptized, God was there. When he died on the cross, that wasn't God. What he's saying here is, yes, when he was pierced in his side, there was blood and there was water. 
What he's saying is, yes, we remember him at his baptism and we eat communion, representing his sacrifice. But what God is saying, and it's about a witness, is that when he was baptized, what did God say? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. When he was on the cross and the blood was shed for you and me, who was present? God. God was there. What he's saying is this Jesus is the Jesus to do with the water and the blood. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Why is it important? Because without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. When you see how Satan has worked this for generations, centuries, with all the occult, all the things in this world today, you understand why John is saying it. People will take another Jesus. You go downtown sometimes and they say, well, I believe Jesus was good. I believe he was maybe a spiritual healer, he was a guru, he was someone. But as soon as you get to the issue of sin, and I'll say, downtown the last few weeks, I've shared with many, many people, well, I, I believe Jesus lived and I believe Jesus was good, but, but you know why Jesus came? Jesus came because of our sin, I don't want that Jesus. That's the Jesus that says, I have to bow my knee, my tongue has to confess that he is Lord. And people have been trained to think in their sin nature, it's actually bad news, but the Bible calls it what? The good news. He says, the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the Spirit of truth. How do you know that Jesus is the Son of God? Because of the Holy Spirit. So what we've heard from John is, there's a couple of testimonies. The testimony is the blood. The testimony is the water. But we've got to ask ourselves, is this throughout the Bible? And we know the answer. I'll read this for you. First John 4, 2, 3, 2. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge it is not of God. Which spirit is it then? This is the spirit of the who? Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and now is already in the word. It doesn't say he's anti-God. It doesn't say he's anti-spirit. He's anti-Muhammad. He's anti-Buddha. He's anti-whoever. It says he's anti-who? Christ, because there's no one in the name above under heaven by which you must be saved. Jesus alone is the way, the truth, and the life. And if we aren't sure enough, we've got to say, why did John even write his gospel? What is God, John's gospel all about? Do you want to know? John 20, 31. Brian and Branches. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah. That Jesus is the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name. This is all this focus is about. Why do I take people to John as soon as they come to faith? You need to get who Jesus is. Your relationship with Jesus. He gives the Holy Spirit. God is in heaven in verse 7. There are three that testify. You guys getting something out of this? You guys see how amazing God is? I mean, I know culture out there is so entertaining and our minds are so other places, but I'm still sitting here thinking, God save Steve. God save my mother. God can save people in your life. Are you preaching? The Jesus Christ who makes people born again. There are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, the blood, and they agree. See, the Word of God alone is enough, but God says, I'm going to show off and boast in who I am. And he says in verse 9, if we receive the testimony of man, meaning the heretics, or even me, John is saying, the testimony of God is greater. Look at how radical this is. This is the testimony of God and that which he has born concerning his Son. He's saying, you want the real testimony? I'm going to give you God's testimony. What would that mean to the heretics? It would mean Deuteronomy 19.15, that a matter must be established by two or three witnesses. So God, we're going to put you on trial. Is Jesus the Son of God? Is He who you claim He is? We have the Word, we have the water, we have the blood, and we have the Spirit. Who else testifies? John 1.6.36, speaking of John the Baptist. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This is John the Baptist. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light. And through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. So John the Baptist witnesses of who Jesus is. John 8, 14. Jesus himself. Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. For I know where I came from and where I am going. You have no idea where I come from where I am going in your own law, which is Moses. So now Moses testifies and Jesus. It is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. Look at what he says in verse 18. I am the one who testifies for myself and my other witness is the Father. Then they asked him, Jesus, who is your Father? This is radical. 
You do not know me, O oh my Father, Jesus replied, because if you knew me, you would know my Father. You cannot know God without Jesus. It is not possible. New Ageism, Spiritualism, everything, Oprah, Deepak Chopra, and all the rest of the guys are preaching will not lead you to Jesus. It will lead you to a white throne where Jesus will not be, and sadly, we're going to be guilty. What Jesus is saying is you can only know, and people might say, well, I don't agree with this. It's not my words. It's God's. All roads do not lead to God in a sense that we're saved. He's saying this, John 15, 26, when the Spirit comes, He will testify about me. John 5, 37, the Father who has sent me testified Himself concerning me. And this is where it sounds harsh. You've never heard His voice, nor seen His form, nor do His word dwell in you, for you did not believe the one who sent me. Everything John is saying is about Jesus. And listen, you might not like this, if you're not a believer, you say, I don't want it to be only one road to God, but here's the reality. Only one person hung up on a cross for you and me. We say it all the time. This is not decoration. This is not furniture. This is a torture device. John's gospel is to tell you God himself wrapped in the flesh. John 1.14 shed his blood for you and me, and that is grace and mercy. And you say, well, does anyone else share it? Yeah, the centurion, Matthew 27.54. Jesus is on the cross. And there he is shedding his blood. And the centurion says, surely this is what? The Son of God. I'm wrapping him up with a few thoughts here. But when they say Jesus is just a man, he was simply born. John 3.13. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven. The Son of Man. The Bible says Jesus came from heaven. He wasn't created. He entered into our eternity. John 1.14. The Word became flesh. 1 John 3.8. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Jesus wasn't just born. He didn't just come into being. He always was. What does it say? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word always was God. He came into being. He appeared into life. He was outside of time. But notice he said, if you knew me, you would know my Father. This is where it's crazy. I have a sister coming to stay with me in just about five or six days and I don't know where she is of the Lord. What do you think my prayer is? I want to have fun, hang out. We're going to go to Harvest and enjoy California. But my prayer is you would know the Lord. Do you know why my prayer is that you would know the Lord? Because of verses like this. Verse 10, John says, Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. But whoever does not believe has made God a what? Liar. I don't think we get this clearly. What the Bible teaches, if you reject Jesus, you're saying he's not the Savior. If you reject Jesus, you're saying God is a liar. And you say, well, pastor, that's just harsh preaching. I'm not the one preaching. This is God's word. He wrote it. This is John who loved him. He says he's a liar, you claim to be, because you have not believed in the testimony that he has come. What's amazing is this. Every sin you've ever committed, everything you've ever done, it can all be forgiven like that. Everything someone did to you that you still have not forgiven. Everything you did to someone else, including yourself. Everything that you think is so dark and damp and disgusting, which the Bible says is filthy rags. It can be forgiven like that. But is there anything that can never be forgiven? It's only one thing. Blasphemy of who? The Holy Spirit. You can blaspheme God and be forgiven. You're mad at God. You're frustrated at God. But blaspheming the Holy Spirit, not receiving Him, Why? Because in 2004, when I was divorced and suicidal, it was the Spirit of God who showed up and saved me. And you could put a gun to my head, and I said, I am good to go. I know that I know that I know that Jesus is Lord. When life is tough, when I'm traveling by myself, when things are crazy, I know that I know that God is good. Why? Because the Spirit of God is He who gives the testimony. Even the disciples, when I was coming to faith, reading Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Christ, the disciples all fled from Jesus when he was taken as a man and they could see him. Yet after dying and resurrecting, he showed up to them. And for the next hundred years, they were all martyred, but the exception of John. That's what it means when the Spirit is in you. Where else should I go but to you, O Lord? He says in verse 11, this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is found in his Son. He says it again, third time, whoever has the Son... Are you a whoever? That's you and I. Whoever has the Son has life, but whoever does not have the Son does not have life. John, why are you writing to me? Because God has sent you a message that, Brian, you've been dead in sin since you were born. 
You're from the seed of Adam. And the only way you can be forgiven is through Jesus, the Son of God. This is the fact. This is the Bible. This is the teaching right here. I want to ask you, what are you going to do with that? People say all the time, I don't know if Jesus is the right religion for me. It's not about Jesus. It's about an eternity separated from God. The Bible teaches there's a real place called hell or there's a place called heaven where you'll spend it with God. Have you been forgiven? Has your faith been in Him? Have we been distracted by the things this well? Have we believed all the false things? And even the people I called out here, you have to. You have to tear down every stronghold. When you preach like this, people say, well, it sounds divisive. It is absolutely divisive. You need to divide only Jesus and Christ alone. We sing it so much. Amen? I'm not running to anyone else. I searched for him for seven months, didn't come to faith. I'm not suicidal today. I'm not frustrated today. I don't want to blow my brains out today only because of Jesus Christ. Amen? John says in John 20 and 31, closing with this thought, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. So for you today, I'm going to ask you, who do you trust in? Do you believe your own witness? Do you believe the world's witness? Do you believe the witness of John's book right here or not? And here's how I want to close this. I want to close this in the time of prayer, sitting and asking the Lord, where are you with God? Let's bow our heads for a moment as the worship band comes up here. Let me ask you, where are you with the Lord? It isn't that we made it to church. It isn't that we have a Bible. I mean, mine's got my name on it. You can get it done at Calvary Chapel Bookstore. It didn't save me. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? As the Holy Spirit showed you, I've sinned. I need to be forgiven. It's a good thing for God to reveal this to you. I wish God would have saved me earlier. But where are you today? Friend, there's nothing you've done that is bigger than the blood of Jesus. Nothing you will ever do. It does not come close. Your sin is not as perfect as his perfect sacrifice. But he went to the cross. And he went to the cross for me. And for Steve. And for my mother. And for you. And he puts this before us and we say, well, wow, God. Either I trust in your gospel, I trust in your witness. Or what you're telling me is that I'm making you a liar? I want to ask us right now for a moment, do you need to get right with God? Are the things you want to say, I've been backslidden, I've been struggling. God, I want to acknowledge today that I have heard your voice and I want to get right with you. I'm going to challenge you big today. You go places and speak and when you give away free stuff, people put up their hands. When you invite them to something fun, they run to the front. But I want to ask you, has the God of the universe been dealing with you about needing to get right with him? If that's you on the count of three and you say, I need to get right with God today, I'm going to invite you to respond. His grace and mercy is free. He paid it all. Moses tried to climb the mountain to get to God, but God came down the mountain to get to man. The wages of our sin is death, but we need to be forgiven. If you're in here today and you say, God, I know I need to get right with you, on the count of three, would you raise up your hands where you are? One, two, three. Hallelujah. Four or five people raising up their hands. Six or seven. Thank you, Lord. This is the word of God. This is the work of God. His spirit in us. What I want to do is take some time right now. There are crosses around this room and we have prayer teams. We have pastors who can go to these crosses. The five of six of you that might have raised your hands. When we begin to worship in a moment, would you make your way to those crosses? And would you get prayer? You don't have to confess your sins to anyone in this room. God knows where you are. But we want to pray with you. For the people in here today, if you want prayer for anything at all, maybe you just want to pray for Chris and the family, maybe you're going through something hard, I'll be down here in the front if you want to come to me, but we're going to open up these crosses. But church, today is about the reality that God himself in the flesh, God on the cross, died for you and me and rose again. I don't care what you're going through, but one day this will all be over. What's physical, what's emotional, what's spiritual, Bring it to the cross. Bring it to a leader. Let's get before the Lord and let's lift them up. Church, would you stand and enter a time of worship with me? Thank you, Jesus.